Good morning, and welcome to today's webinar on the Alzheimer's disease update 2022. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the McGill University Research Center in Studies in Aging is located and our work is done on the unceded indigenous lands. The Kanekinkake Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Titoki, commonly known as Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is a home to a diverse group of indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, the present and future in our ongoing relationships with indigenous and other peoples we serve who live within the Montreal community. My name is Dolly Dastor and I'm the chair of the education committee, which is hosting the seminar. January is Alzheimer's Awareness Month. And during this month, we at the McGill University Research Center in Aging encourage individuals like you to learn more about dementia and its stark impact on Canadians. And while Alzheimer's Awareness Month may end on January 31st, the experiences of people who live with dementia do not. As such, we ask you to take what you will learn today and have learned during this month to share with others throughout the year. By understanding what people living with dementia experience in their day-to-day -day lives, their struggles, their successes, and their hopes, together we can raise awareness of Alzheimer's dementia throughout Canada. Awareness is the first step in fighting stigma, reinforcing human rights, and pushing for policy change, as well as other actions that can lift up Canadians living with dementia. Stigma is one of the biggest barriers of people living with dementia to live fully with respect and dignity. We must first fight stigma by learning more about the disease. On June 17, 2019, the Government of Canada released the country's first ever national dementia strategy labeled a Dementia Strategy for Canada, Together We Aspire. We need to know that strategy and promote it. For this year's theme for the Alzheimer Month, the Alzheimer Society of Canada has announced a nationwide campaign reminding people that Alzheimer Society is the first link to support, knowledge, and community. And we at the McGill University Research Center for Aging do our part by disseminating on every Tuesday of the month since the last two years, knowledge about dementia with all its ramifications to people with dementia, to their families and to the general public. Because dementia, especially Alzheimer's dementia, not only affects the memory of the person, but much more. It affects the behavior, the well being of the person, as well as that of the family, especially the primary caregiver. <clears throat> a diagnosis of Alzheimer's dementia is life changing for the person with the disease, as well as their family and friends. But information and support are available. No one has to face Alzheimer's disease or another dementia alone. More than a half a million Canadians are living with Alzheimer's or other dementia. And that number is expected to reach almost 1 million in 10 years. And worldwide, at least 44 million people are living today with dementia. That is more than the total population of Canada, making the disease a global health crisis that must be addressed. And in this pandemic, people with dementia have been relegated to the background. The CHSLDs and other long-term care homes have had tragic results of neglect and deaths in the elderly, many among them suffering from dementia. By not allowing families to visit and activities and outings to be curtailed, it affects the welfare and the health of the people. While there are currently no treatments to stop Alzheimer's disease from progressing, but there are medications to treat dementia symptoms, in the past three decades, dementia research has provided a much deeper understanding of how Alzheimer affects the brain. Today, researchers are continuing to look for more effective treatments and a cure, as well as ways to prevent this disease and improve brain health. 
Knowledge is another theme for this year, learning more about dementia through the work done by the clinicians and scientists at the McGill Research Center and by our partners, the Alzheimer's Society of Montreal and Alzheimer Group. May res may many resources can help identify the warning signs of dementia, get them an early diagnosis so that they can get the help and support they need earlier. A little learning and knowledge about the evolution of the disease can make all the difference in helping someone live with dementia as early as possible. <coughs> Dr. Rosanetto will start the webinar with his talk titled Forgetfulness <coughs> and Early Alzheimer's Disease. Dr. President Rosanetto, or Dr. PRN as he fondly called, obtained his degree from the Federal University Rio Grande de Sul, Brazil, and his doctorate and PhD in Aarhus University Pet Center, Denmark. And he's a professor of neurology, neurosurgery, and psychiatry <coughs> at McGill University, affiliated to the Douglas Research Center. He specialized in modeling dementia, pathophysiological and progressive, using imaging and fluid biomarkers. Dr. Rosanetto is the director of the McGill Center for Studies in Aging, a fond de research scientific, a Quebec senior scholar, and vice chair of the CCNA Team 2. In inflammation and tropic factors, deregulation of Alzheimer's disease. He's also a committee member of the fourth and the fifth Canadian Consensus Conference on the Diagnosis and Treatment of Dementia. Dr. Rosanetto, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you for the, the kind introduction uh, uh, and for presenting. Uh, this is very important uh, a moment at the Brainy Brumer Lectures where you're discussing many topics about uh, Alzheimer's disease. And I'd like to talk about early signs of dementia, particularly uh, memory loss. So uh, memory is affected in the very early stages of uh, Alzheimer's disease. And uh, can, can you see my slides? Yes. And here you can see that there is a deposition of uh, amyloid, uh, of a tau protein in the centers of the brain that controls memory. So this is a person without uh, uh, any Alzheimer's disease. So this is the MRI, the pictures of the brain. And you can see here in white where the tau is, is getting accumulated in the brain and it's just right there on the regions that control memory. So this, uh, problems, biological problems on the memory centers, they will reflect in various symptoms, such as losing objects, uh, becoming more dependent in notes, calendars, agendas, smartphones to remember appointments, and uh, problems related to uh, difficulties to transmit messages and to lose details from the information that you want, want to obey. Uh, to the point that patients can be repeating the same questions over and over again, simply because they forgot that they have uh, asked the question and, and forgot also the answers. So what's wrong with the memory of patients with early Alzheimer's disease? So I'd like to introduce here the, the cassette model. So most of you will remember this. This is the cassette tape recorder. And then you have a microphone here. And then you have this tape and you have the play uh, key. So the problems that can arise either, memory problems can arise either from the microphone, from the tape, and from the mechanism underlying the <coughs> the pay clean. So memory is the act of retrieving the, uh, the information that is stored in the tape. If the microphone is not working, meaning the person is not paying attention, or the microphone has a defect, or a person has a sensory problem, like a difficulty for, for hearing, uh, this can Infer, this can impact on the quality of the material that is stored on the tape. 
if the mechanism to retrieve the memory is altered, is abnormal, it's nearly impossible to know what's in the tape. And if the tape itself is not working, this represents a problem. I'm going to tell you right now that Alzheimer's disease is a disease of the tape. So the memory has three uh, steps. There is an encoding part where you learn new information. Somebody will tell some stories or tell a new information. After that, this memory is consolidated in the brain. And this is kind of incredible because the memory traces, they are physically uh, located in the brain. So at the level of neurons and level of biochemical processes. And, and by uh, uh, this, pro, uh, this uh, incorporation of uh, this information into the cells, into the body of the cells, uh, we call it storage. So the storage, uh, enable us to pass this information through to another individual. And by retrieving this information, you can pass this, uh, our feelings and our experience towards another person whenever you want. So how to test in patients the microphone, the tape, and the play key? So uh, here we have a context where you have a, psycho a psychometrician, you have a person that would like to be tested, and an instrument that is the world, world list. So the psychometrician, psychometrician asks to the person uh, to read these words, and the person will read aloud. So the first word is a lemonade, and a strainer, a lorry, a museum, and a grasshopper. So then the psychometrician will ask to the person to tell what, from this list, what was the drink? And the person will repeat, you will tell us that the lemonade, uh, what was the kitchen uh, utensil? And the person will say the straining. What's the vehicle? And the person will tell the, the lorry. What's the building? And the person will answer the museum. And the, if what's the insect? And the person will tell the grasshopper. If the person is incapable to tell this word, it means this the list of words immediately after doing this exercise of reading, the person has a problem with a microphone. So this has to do with the attention that this person is paying to this exercise and the ability to retain this information in the brain. This is called the Grober and Bush paradigm because it was invented or developed by the student neuropsychologists. So to evaluate the rest of the system, we have to wait for five minutes. And the psychometrician will ask again, tell me the five words. And if, if the person is capable to remember the five words, we can conclude that the tape, the play key, and the microphone are normal. If the person is unable to do that, the psychometrician will give the hints, they will give some clues. What was the drink? What was the kitchen uh, utensil? What's the vehicle? What's the building? And what's the insect? If the person is capable to retrieve, we are controlling for the key button that cannot access the tape. But once you give a clue, the person is capable to go to the tape and to retrieve the list of words that was learned five minutes before. If the person is incapable to retrieve this list of words, the person has a problem with the tape. And this is a very sensitive test to identify individuals with early onset, early Alzheimer's disease. So encoding problems, the problems associated with the microphone can be due to depression, can be due to attention deficit, can be due to stress, and perhaps to other neurodegenerative conditions, non-Alzheimer's disease type. The problems related to the, to the tape, to the storage, are usually a consequence of Alzheimer's disease pathophysiology at its early stages.
And problems related to the obtaining the information with the problems related to the uh, play key are a consequence of disease like cerebral vascular disease, brain tumors, et cetera, et cetera. So to summarize, uh, patients uh, with normal aging can take some bad decision based on, on their previous memory. But patients, if, uh, nor but patients with Alzheimer's disease, they will make a poor judgments and decisions very frequently. It's normal to expect that in, during normal aging, a, a person can uh, miss a monthly payment. But in patients with Alzheimer's disease, there will be problems taking care of monthly bills. So this is much more frequent. In normal aging, forgetting which day it is and remember it later, it's normal. But losing the track of the date and the time of the year, it's a sign of the disease, Alzheimer's disease. So it's normal sometimes forgetting which, forgetting which word to use. But if you forget so frequently that it imposes problems to communicate, this is a sign of Alzheimer's disease. So losing things from time to time, it's frequently found in, in normal aging. But misplacing things often and being unable to find them is a sign of Alzheimer's disease. I'd like to thank you for the attention. And that was a very interesting talk, Dr. Rosaletto. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Megan Williams, Director of Support Services from the Alzheimer Group, Inc. Her talk is Healthy Caregiving, Setting Realistic Expectations. Megan is a member of the Education Committee of the McGill Research Center for Studies in Aging. She has been working at the Alzheimer Group for 13 years. After completing her Master of Social Work at McGill University, she began working at the AGI as a counselor, providing support to families, facilitating support groups, and training to professionals. Now, in her role as Director of Support Services, Megan is responsible for ensuring that AGI programs continue to respond to the needs of families and individuals with diagnosis of dementia. Megan, please start your presentation. Everyone can hear me? Yes. Yeah. Great. Um, so thank you so much for having me today. I think this is a, I'm, I'm here to talk about healthy caregiving. Um, AGI, for those of you who don't know, is a charitable organization that supports families uh, and individuals living with dementia. When I was asked to give this talk, I had to reflect, reflect on really what is healthy caregiving. Um, and then I thought, is it really fair to put more pressure on families and, to encourage them to do something different and actually take care of themselves? We all know the airplane analogy. You know, you're in an airplane, there's a crash, you put on your own ma oxygen mask first before helping others. But caregivers are so tired, they're stressed, they're burnt out, they might not even know where to find the oxygen mask. Okay. Oops. There we go. So I wanted to start by talking a little bit about what the caregiving trajectory looks like. So when you're caring for someone with living with dementia, we know the road can be very long and it looks different for every person. Typically, when a person is first diagnosed, the caregivers, and, and, and I'm gonna pause for a second, I'm just talking about caregiving right now. Um, and obviously um, people living with dementia can be very much included in this care plan. But for today's talk, I'm just gonna be focusing on caregiving. So, to continue, when someone is first diagnosed, families in general, um, they are managing well. The person is able to be left home alone and caregivers, the primary caregiver or spouse or adult child, you know, can still leave them home alone. Everyone can go off and do their own individual um, activities. You can still go to social events with friends. You can go to the gym, you can go shopping without a big concern about safety um, and how the person is managing on their own. 
as things progress, some caregivers slowly, so you'll see them slowly start to withdraw a little bit from gatherings and they start to sacrifice their own interest to support their loved one. They neglect their needs trying to ensure that the person is well looked after. The reality is that this road, the, every situation is unpredictable to, to for most extent. Caregivers are always concerned about the unknown, what's going to happen in the next stage, and what are the next steps. So I wanted to talk a little bit about signs of stress and how stress actually impacts caregiving, any person's health actually. So you can see in the, this image, you see how it affects your physical, your emotional, your behavioral, and your psychological stress. So we can, how we feel in the day, uh, are we sleeping well? Um, do you have low energy? Are you nervous frequently? Um, do you find yourself becoming a little bit more irritable, agitated? Um, you have some mood swings. Then sometimes a sign of stress is if you can't focus, if you have poor judgment, um, and also if you're fidgeting or you're, you're doing bad habits, like you're biting nails or anything. So when a person is in stress, they are actually acting as though there are the early signs of dementia. So think about that and now think about trying to care for someone else. When we're talking about stress, when caregivers become stressed, it also reflects in the person living with dementia. The person living with dementia might not remember the facts of maybe an argument or a dispute, but they can sense that something isn't right. So when caregivers at the end of the day are extremely stressed, you know, it's been a long day, things haven't gone right, perhaps, you know, that person with dementia they too feel something and this is when they might become anxious or they might become a little bit more agitated. So stress becomes so extreme that, you know, even caregivers have a hard time kind of stepping back and seeing how their own stress is impacting the person living with dementia. It's actually a vicious circle because the more that this caregiver is stressed, then the more the person living with dementia is which then adds more stress to the caregiver. Caregiver burnout is something that we hear often. It's a state of exhaustion accompanied by feelings of depression or stress. If you're burnt out, you may feel like you're at your limit, mentally and physically. When caregiver becomes burnt out, his or her attitude may become more negative and it's harder to provide care. One thing that we haven't even, I haven't even mentioned is about the grief. Grief of the losses, you know, loss of the relationship that you might have with your loved one once they have um, been diagnosed with dementia. The grief over the change of roles, grief over, you know, what's to come. Um, future planning might look very different. Grief is essentially a process, a roller coaster a messy tangled up ball. In addition to the stress and the burnout, caregivers are constantly grieving the losses and the changes in their loved one caused by the disease. So here we are, we get to the slide about what is healthy caregiving? Well, essentially uh, it can be defined as staying physically and emotionally strong, exercise regularly, eating a well-balanced diet, coping well and seeing your physician regularly. So it essentially is like self-care. I wonder for a second, how many people who aren't caregivers are actually achieving all of these goals right now? AGI's opinion about healthy caregivers isn't necessarily about achieving all these goals. It's about doing good enough. We have to realize that the expectations that we put on ourselves as a caregiver doesn't have to be perfect because no one is perfect. 
And it's about really doing the best you can in that given moment. So what are some barriers to self-care and healthy caregiving? Well, first of all, there's an external barrier. So the resources that are available there to support you. So some caregivers don't know which resources actually exist or they might not be able to access the resources. For example, people in the early stages of dementia, families might be burnt out at this point or caregivers might be extremely stressed. But the way that the systems is set up is really for to help support people in the later stages of the disease more with the physical care. Accessing respite can be extremely difficult also, uh, especially during COVID, you know, just not wanting someone to come into your house, um, that is a barrier. Then we talk about what barriers for self-care that's happening internally. People have trouble accepting support. They feel that they can do it all or that they should be doing it all because that they've made maybe an oath for better or for worse. And they know that other people around them are extremely busy or they don't want to burden them. Another internal barrier would be the person has a hard time setting boundaries, a hard time saying no to things, um, setting your limits. And also the person might have a hard time. They've never taken care of themselves. They've always put other people first and they've always neglected their own needs. So one way that we at AGI, we try to help guide caregivers is that look at the things that you know, if, if it's stress, if it's too many things on your list, think about the things that you actually have to get done in a day or things that are bothering you that you are on your to-do list. And maybe you want to cross out all the things that you actually enjoy doing. So save those for yourself. Then as you go through the list, slowly look at maybe you want to circle things that maybe a family member could help you with, or maybe a counselor could maybe support you uh, with. So kind of go through that list step by step to help make it a little bit more attainable. This is a slide where we all, you know, when I think about caregiving, they want to do it all. You know, they think that they can prepare whatever meal, they can make all the appointments, drive the person to um, whatever activities. And at the end of the day, they, the reality is that it can get a little bit messy. And this is where we really need to get some help. So here are a few tips for a healthier, having a healthier outlook. This comic actually uh, made me laugh a little bit. It says, I used to try to take each day at a time. I'd eat each day as it came. You know, live one day at a time. My philosophy has changed. I'm down to half a day at a time. I actually think this is quite true. You need to start small. You know, if it's about getting through breakfast in the morning or getting your helping your loved one get dressed in the morning, keep that as your first to do and start small. Appreciate those small successes um, and and reward yourselves and reward the person living with dementia. You know, sit and have a coffee. Wow, that was really that was really tough getting dressed or deciding what we wanted to wear today, wasn't it? Another tip for a healthier outlook would be educate yourself. Gain knowledge about what resources, networks, respite options there are available to you, whether it's now or in the future. You always want to have a toolkit ready for you in case you need it, even if you don't think you need it right now. The next thing is to educate yourself on how to build skills as a caregiver. Learn about the disease. It's extremely important to understand that the person living with dementia is doing the best they can. The more you build skills over maybe going to lectures like these or um, reading a book or being part of a support group, you will realize that um, it gets a little bit easier as you get to know what's really happening with your loved one. Another thing is to know what to expect, plan, and help, and navigate your, your way for the future. Sometimes people um, who come into our office, they want to know what's happening, you know, three years from now. How long will I be caring for someone at this point? 
Other people only wanna know what's gonna happen six months from now. So know yourself and know what your limits are. And lastly, other tips for healthier outlook would require take regular time outs during the day to recharge. I even encourage family members if the only time that they can get some time for themselves is lock themselves in the bathroom, take their phone, take their iPad, and you know listen to a podcast. It's it's those small little moments of the day that will help hopefully recharge them. I do know caregivers who have actually gone overnight um, and had a had an overnight break and the challenge is that when they come back you know from that little overnight trip that it's it's exactly where they left off so we actually encourage people to take regular small breaks throughout the day just to to better um, self-care accept offers uh, to help now this can be very challenging how many times have you had someone call you and say, can I do anything for you? Can I help you? And families don't even know what that looks like. So think about it. Again, maybe you have to make a list. Maybe when things come up, write it down. And when someone says, you know, what can I do? Maybe it's about just, you know, doing an activity with your loved one so you can go and have a shower or you can go for a walk around the block and have some fresh air. It makes all the difference. Maintain contact with family and friends. Do not isolate yourself. This is so important. You know, if you're worried about what your friends or family or might think about how a new behavior that your loved one is expressing, then maybe it's time to educate your family and to give them a heads up and make it less fearful for them. Um, you know, I think it's again about uh, awareness and breaking the stigma with this disease. Maintain a, self, a sense of self outside of caregiving. This is so important. You are not just a caregiver. You are a spouse. You are a daughter. You are a son. You are a friend. What was it like before you were a caregiver? Try to do one of those activities, even if you can't. I heard recently that someone joined a cooking class online just to continue their joy of cooking. Remember what you can't control and what you can control. You can't control the progression of this disease, but what you can control is how you react to it, how you handle it, and how you take care of yourself. And lastly, I would like to say, just be kind to yourself. Realize that you have good days and bad days, good moments and bad moments. And the moment you start your day, you can change. Allow yourself, if you're mourning, if you're grieving, allow yourself to be angry, sad, and sorrowful, whatever it might be for five minutes in that day, and then try to move on and see the positive of the day because you need you and the person that you're caring for needs you. So please understand that you are an important part of this equation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Megan. This was a very educative talk. And I think most of us have been caregivers or will be caregivers in the very near future. And we can learn a lot from this. Thank you so much. And again, as I said, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we will answer them as soon as we finish our presentations. We now go on to Dr. Michael Weisman, a dentist, who is also a um, um, member of the education committee. And as we said that, Although Alzheimer's disease does not only affect the memory, it does, but it also affects the rest of the body. And he's going to tell us how the gums can affect our behavior. Dr. Weissman is a Megill Dentistry graduate, an assistant professor in the faculty, and is a fellow of the American Board of Special Care Dentistry, a diploma, diplomat of the American Board of Special Care Dentistry, and a member of the Royal College of Surgeons and of Edinburgh in special needs dentistry. He specializes in geriatric dentistry, and we've had many cases referred to him very successfully. So, Doctor, and he's going to talk to us on healthy gums for a healthy mind. I think we all need that. Dr. Weisman, can you please give us us your words of wisdom? So, thank you very much for the kind invitation to speak to everybody today. Um, Alzheimer's, we worry about that. Um, 
Time magazine put it on their cover saying this is the new unknown, okay? How do we treat it? Well, this is a slide from a friend of mine named Linda Neeson. This is from her textbook on geriatric dentistry. And it basically is talking about the rate of Alzheimer's disease. And the way it looks, it looks like it's an epidemic, like it's uh, like a COVID. We're all going to get it. Well, in one sense, we may all get it, but we may not all get it at the same time. The reason why we're seeing a higher increase over time is really due to the baby booming uh, effect, the age group going through it. We represent a very large population. And yes, for our group, including myself, I'm a baby boomer, we, have, we may have a higher rate of numbers of dementia, but it does not mean that it's like a COVID infection. But we do know there are a variety of risk factors for Alzheimer's. You can have genetics uh, factors, such work that's done by Dr. Gauthier and Serge Poirier at the McGill Center for Studies and Aging, a familial history. Uh, you can have blood problems. You can have smoking. You can have hypertension. They can all these factors that can cause vascular problems as well that could lead to dementia. But let's talk about about the gums. There is a theory of the inflammatory theory of Alzheimer's disease. This basically says that um, inflammation, okay, may occur in the brain tissues that may lead to these effects that we're seeing in the brains of Alzheimer's patients. Now, I just want you to remember this uh, slide here. Purely by the age group in which we start getting the microglial activation. Okay, so we're talking about uh, late 50s, early 60s, and so on. You start getting these cells in the brain, which are like macrophages, that are like big Pac-Man. They'll go around the brain and eat up uh, bad uh, cells, et cetera, et cetera, uh, go on into the brain. And this is, uh, these are important cells to help prevent disease but they may be linked to disease as well. We know that elderly people are prone to a multiple group of infections. The three most common infections elderly people have are urine and tract infections, uh, intra-abdominal infections such as like diverticulitis and appendicitis, yeast infections, and yes, gum disease or periodontal infections. We know that the elderly have decreased immune responses. When we look at it, I'm being a dentist, look in your mouth, be in my dental chair. I take this little instrument, which you all now don't grit your teeth thinking about it, but a straight probe that we stick into the gums gently. And we look to see um, if there's any bleeding on probing, how much bone loss you have in the area there how much of gums are still attached to your tooth, and of course, how much plaque that you may have in your mouth. All these factors are indexes of gum disease, and research have shown that patients with dementia have higher levels of these problems. So they have bigger uh, depths of probing, uh, more bleeding, higher plaque levels. All these things together seem to indicate a link potentially between gum disease and dementia. We know that gum disease or periodontal disease is a polymicrobial inflammatory disease, okay, that eventually will lead to tooth loss, okay, so the teeth get loose in the socket with more bone loss and out goes the teeth, okay. We know that patients um, over 55 years of age at least 50% of them will have gum disease, okay? And we talked about the gum tissues, this nice big red gum tissue that supports the tooth, okay? Um, it's more than just that, okay? We know that inside the gum, the cuffs that goes around the tooth, <clears throat> we see a whole bunch of bacteria and viruses and the gum tissues themselves in regard to inflammation will go and produce a whole bunch of immune and inflammatory products. 
So we see here in this slide here, this is your gums, the cough going around your tooth. This is some calculus. And you see the beautiful, this is the nice and pink and red, we know our gum tissues. Um, beautiful vascular system. And we know that bacteria will travel, okay? Here's a section of a brain tissue in which they found oral bugs in the brain of the patient. And the theory is, is that with gum disease, okay, you get systemic inflammation, i.e. that not just inflammation around the gums, the inflammatory products, the viruses, the bacteria will travel in the blood system to go further. And this can go and cross a compromised um, brain barrier, okay, and go through a variety of different mechanisms to lead to tangles and the microglial uh, activation to eventually leading to um, beta amyloid uh, deposition and of course, Alzheimer's disease. This is the theory of how gum disease may be linked to Alzheimer's disease. One of the other interesting things was that a study was found, okay, we know that we give patients who are of Alzheimer's, we give them uh, anticholinesterase inhibitors, i.e. to keep this uh, neurotransmitter as long as possible in the brain to get as much activity as possible. An interesting study was so shown that animals who lose teeth prematurely because of the study actually have decreased amounts of acetylcholine production. Therefore, with the gum disease, when you lose teeth, you will then lose acetylcholine production and it yielded, <clears throat> excuse me, learning and memory disorders. <clears throat> the mouth is the mouth, the brain is the brain. We heard that forever. When I was in dental school, we learned about the blood brain barrier being like a saran wrap <clears throat> that covers the brain, covers the spinal cord, and prevents anything from going through. Well, that idea is changed now. The blood brain barrier we know with age becomes fenestrated. Sorry about that. I am in my office. <laughs> becomes fenestrated. And so products can go from the mouth through the blood brain barrier into the brain. Not only that, we know that bacteria and other things can follow the uh, cranial nerves back into the brain. And in the mouth, of course, you have uh, the cranial nerve number five, okay, not appropriate, no test on that. And you have the olfactory nerves as well, which can easily pass things into the brain. Um, as well as we know that microorganisms can hook onto red blood cells and stick themselves into the brain. And all these inflammatory products that we know that causes inflammation, such as interleukin-6, C-reactive proteins, all these factors will travel from the gum tissue up into the brain. How can we prevent and cure Alzheimer's disease? I can only tell you one thing. Brush your teeth, floss, and see your dentist regularly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Weisman. I think we should all follow your advice and do what you're telling us to do so that we prevent or at least delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease. So thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, we're going from the brain to the language and how we speak and how we understand. Dr. Paolo Vitali is a board certified neurologist and a neuropsychologist at the Swiss Nord de Ile de Montréal and at McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging. And he's also a member of our education committee. Dr. Vitali is currently involved in the assessment and follow up of patients presenting with neurodegenerative diseases, especially atypical dementia, presenting with language impairments. He has recorded his speech and he's going to talk to us in French. And his talk is entitled, Dr. Je cherche mes mots, est-ce que je dois m'inquiète? 
something we all have problems with. We all can't ex- find the right word at the right time. So Dr. Vitalis is going to tell us what we should be doing it about it. Bonjour à tous. Uh, docteur, uh, je cherche mes mots. Est-ce que je dois m'inquiéter? Voici donc une question que j'entends euh, souvent et qui certainement vous vous êtes déjà posé euh, dans votre quotidien. Et on va essayer de répondre à, à cette question euh, pendant cette présentation. Euh, déjà, vous voyez que les plaintes cognitives, parmi les plaintes cognitives plus fréquentes dans les vieillissements, ont euh, les, les plaintes les relatives au, au, au langage, notamment un manque de mots, une difficulté à définir euh, et à, à retrouver les bons mots lors d'une conversation, font partie des plaintes les plus fréquentes dans les vieillissements. Euh, dans les vieillissements. <coughs> Il faut dire aussi que euh, lorsqu'on vieillit, il y a des euh, changements qui surviennent euh, aussi euh, à niveau du, du, du langage, de notre habileté donc à communiquer. Il y a, il y a pas tout, tout n'est pas négatif. Là, il y a aussi certaines euh, améliorations qui surviennent tout au long de notre vie, notamment au niveau du langage. Là, par exemple, on est capable d'acquérir plusieurs informations, de nouveaux mots, de nouveaux mots complexes, abstraits même pas dans la vie. Là. Donc tout ça en lien avec une meilleure utilisation du contexte et des informations qui nous entourent, avec la capacité euh, euh, grandissante de les intégrer dans des euh, contextes qui ont du, qui prennent du sens en fait. Par contre, euh, en vieillissement, on, on voit plus fréquemment l'usage et euh, de certains mots, euh, certaines hésitations lorsqu'on parle, euh, euh, certains ralentissements, certains mots de remplissage comme tout voit et bien euh, ou des mots indéfinis, des mots passent partout comme chose, machin, bidule truc euh, et en même temps là aussi les, les phrases on a, on a, sont plus courtes sont moins complexes il y a moins de subordinés il y a moins d'utilisation des phrases passives par exemple donc euh, ça c'est des phénomènes liés au vieillissement qui est en général normal et bien évidemment il y a ces phénomènes là du, du, du gelé sous le bout de la langue qui est quelque chose là qui est très pervasif et, et certainement tous euh, euh, vous savez de quoi je parle Euh, avant d'identifier euh, quelqu'un, étiqueter quelqu'un comme ayant un problème de langage, euh, il faut quand même s'assurer que la, la, la personne en question n'a pas un problème d'audition ou n'a pas une perte visuelle. Là, on, on voit maintenant avec l'usage pervasif là, des masques chirurgicaux dans le contexte de la COVID là, qu'on a vraiment plus de misère à, à, à faire des conversations parce qu'on est moins capable de lire, par exemple, sur, sur les lèvres, donc à nous aider à comprendre, à pas il y a certaines difficultés auditives, on perd tous les contextes aussi euh, et émotionnels en fait, euh, liés à, à la communication, l'expression visuelle en fait, qui va avec euh, le discours. En fait. euh, il y a aussi des fois un mauvais dent, euh, un dentier qui est mal placé ou des usages de certains médicaments qui sèchent la bouche, la salive, tout ça, ça donne une mauvaise articulation en fait, euh, et donc ça contribue à une communication beaucoup moins efficace. Il y a aussi un ralentissement euh, psychomoteur euh, plutôt généralisé qu'on peut euh, des fois observer chez la personne vieillissante qui également ça peut, peut se manifester avec un ralentissement à niveau du langage. Euh, et bien évidemment, tout, tout lorsque euh, on, on est fatigué, on, est, on a mal dormi, on fait plusieurs choses en même temps, euh, tout ça c'est pas bon pour euh, notre, euh, notre fonctionnement cognitif et en même temps pour euh, notre habileté langagère, notre capacité à communiquer. Euh, mais euh, lorsque euh, Quand est-ce qu'il qu'il faut commencer à, à, à s'inquiéter là? Euh, Par exemple, si j'ai euh, oublié euh, les noms de connaissances ou d'un collègue, ou de quelqu'un qui on voit euh, même fréquemment, mais peut-être pas tous les jours, là, ou bien là, avoir occasionnellement certaines difficultés à trouver certains mots particuliers, peut-être en, avec un usage euh, plutôt euh, Euh, pour fréquent, donc tout ça, ça peut être quelque chose là qui qui, qui n'est pas inquiétant. Là. Par contre, lorsque on, on a plus de difficultés à retrouver, par exemple, les noms de, des mots plus fréquents, les mots euh, qu'on utilise à tous les jours, ou, ou et ça de façon répétitive, ou 
bien les, les noms des, 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 des nos enfants, des nos petits enfants, euh, où on fait, on, on commence à faire des substitutions des sons ou utiliser des, des, des sons inappropriés. Mais euh, là, il faut alors commencer à penser qu'il y a peut-être quelque chose qui euh, qui n'est pas qui n'est pas correct. Enfin, euh, lorsque j'ai euh, je vois quelqu'un en clinique, euh, souvent euh, il me parle des problèmes de mémoire en faisant référence à une difficulté à trouver euh, à trouver ces mots. Bon, là il faut distinguer entre c'est une plainte euh, de mémoire et une plainte de langage. En fait, une plainte de mémoire, ça se manifeste en général avec une difficulté à se souvenir euh, des, des événements, des, on oublie des rendez-vous, on oublie des anniversaires pourtant bien connus, on, on fait répéter beaucoup. Euh, on a de la difficulté à prendre des, des, des nouvelles informations. Ça, c'est des plaintes de mémoire. Lorsqu'on parle des plaintes de langage, c'est différent. Donc, comment on peut, on peut les adresser Comment on peut les questionner Est-ce que la personne est aussi articulée qu'auparavant Est-ce que son vocabulaire est aussi riche qu'avant Est-ce qu'il commet des, des modifications euh, à un niveau des sons, des mots, il y a des substitutions, est-ce qu'il a de la misère à, 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 à suivre une conversation, à comprendre ce qu'on lui dit, à exécuter des commandes, ou il fait des substitutions des sons, utilise les mauvais mots. Euh, ou, euh, bon, tout ça, ça peut, euh, ça peut donc euh, montrer un euh, problème du langage. Lorsqu'on parle d'un problème acquis du langage, on parle d'aphasie. Okay? Donc, la phasie, c'est un trouble acquis de langage. C'est quelqu'un qui, par avant, était absolument capable d'utiliser euh, son langage de façon fonctionnelle. Euh, ça peut se manifester par une difficulté euh, expressive ou réceptive, donc à s'exprimer ou à euh, entendre euh, ce que les autres disent. Ça peut se manifester à l'écrit, à, à la lecture ou bien verbalement. Il y a plusieurs façons de l'examiner avec des tests formels, mais, formels, mais rien qu'en écoutant euh, comment la personne parle et en faisant certains gestes, certains examens simples, on peut donc évaluer les habiletés euh, euh, expressives en fait, et euh, réceptives à, à un examen. Par exemple, vous voyez ici un exemple d'apraxie de la parole. Bibliothèque. Bibliothèque. Monsieur. Monsieur. Saskatchewan. Huh. Saskatchewan. <rire> Donc, ici, la patiente présente une partie de la parole, c'est une difficulté précise à niveau de la, de la planification motrice des sons du, euh, ou, euh, ou, 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 parole, euh, euh, donc, le discours est non, la morure et les distorsions euh, des sons. Euh, ici, par exemple, il y a un autre exemple de difficulté de dénomination. C'est bien, qu'est-ce que c'est? Mais le mot, le mot vient pas. Le premier. Ok. Il a dit on. Comment tant que je peux le regarder? Vas-y, toi. Ça, je ne sais pas. Alors, donc, sur les premiers cinq mots à dénommer, euh, il était capable de donner son nom avion. Il a dit, euh, dans Tortue pour Cocodril et Bibit pour uh, Fourmi. Donc, vous voyez là aussi les substitutions euh, des, des, des mots, des distorsions de sang aussi. Euh, et, euh, il, tout le langage peut aussi se manifester à l'écrit avec des erreurs d'orthographe, là, des, des, euh, on écrit au sang, on, on, on oublie un petit peu les règles euh, euh, à, à, à l'écriture, les, les règles d'orthographe, en fait, on appelle ça une dysorthographie. Et euh, également, on peut avoir des pertes de connaissance liées au concept, aux mots et euh, aux, 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 à certains euh, personnages connus, à certains monuments connus, en fait. Euh, donc, sans protester ça, simplement en demandant 
où on, on, on a l'intention de dénommer certaines, certains personnages connus ou certains monuments, en fait. Euh, on peut aussi euh, faire répéter certaines phrases complexes. Près de la table, dans le salon. Près de la table, près du salon. Hier soir, ils l'ont entendu à la radio. Hier soir, ils l'ont entendu à la radio. Ils l'ont entendu à la radio. Voilà, donc euh, euh, ici, euh, vous voyez la répétition des phrases est très difficile à faire, hein, et ça, ça, c'est quelque chose qu'il faut, il faut rechercher lorsque quelqu'un euh, se présente avec euh, une plainte. Une Près de la table. Ça peut indiquer certaines, euh, certaines pathologies précises, en fait. Donc là, euh, lorsqu'on on, on a ce genre de difficile, là, il faut essayer de caractériser un petit peu le, le, quand est-ce que ça a commencé, comment ça a commencé. Alors, ben, certainement, c'est quelque chose qui se manifeste de, de, assez rapidement, les dans les quelques minutes, à quelques secondes, on peut évoquer un accident cérébrovasculaire, ou, euh, une hémorragie, euh, ou même un épisode peut-être de nature épileptique. Là, en fait. Donc, euh, par contre, c'est si quelqu'un euh, qui développe des symptômes sur quoi plusieurs semaines, euh, le temps pour évoquer la possibilité d'un processus plus euh, infectieux, ou un processus plus euh, neoplasique, euh, le cancer le cérébral, on peut voir ça à l'occasion. Euh, par contre, euh, que, quelqu'un qui présente des symptômes lentement progressifs, sur plusieurs mois, plusieurs années, avec un impact fonctionnel graduel à, à, à travers tout ça, mais là, c'est peut-être plus euh, quelque chose des natures neurodégénératives, donc les, 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 une pathologie plus liée à la mort neuronale euh, dégénérative euh, liée à une pathologie comme l'Alzheimer, par exemple. Euh, en passant, l'Alzheimer, vous connaissez tout, se manifeste classiquement par un problème de mémoire dans les euh, formes plus classiques, mais il y a des variantes euh, langagères de, de l'Alzheimer qui se présentent classiquement avec une présentation, un problème de langage qui est euh, souvent caractérisé par un manque de mots assez, euh, assez important avec des, des phrases euh, tangentielles, vides et contenues et euh, une multitude de trous et des mots déformés. Aussi, la compréhension, les gens font répéter beaucoup parce qu'on quand on dit de la misère à, 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 à un temps à comprendre un petit peu le, les, 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 les discours des autres et en même temps la, leur répétition de phrases est très touchée. Là. Donc c'est cette forme euh, langagère atypique là, de la maladie de la Zainer souvient en général chez les gens qui sont plus jeune, un fait qui est, qui est l'habitude, et euh, on, on parle des, 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 des formes isolées euh, de l'Alzheimer lorsque le déficit langagé est isolé pendant euh, au moins deux ans de toute autre attente euh, cognitive. Ça, ça fait partie du spectre des aphasies euh, primaires progressives, en fait, donc des, euh, des tous les langages progressifs de nature neurodégénérative. Si vous avez des doutes, bien sûr, là, la meilleure chose à faire, c'est en parler avec euh, votre médecin qui sera capable de faire un premier, une première évaluation du euh, screening et au besoin de vous référer à des euh, centres spécialisés comme les nôtres, le centre médical et l'étude sur les vieillissements, qui, où on, on est capable de poser un diagnostic précis euh, et euh, vous référer au, euh, aux professionnels, euh, aux ressources euh, euh, et, importante et nécessaire selon votre euh, votre cas. En parlant des ressources, là voici quelques liens euh, utiles. Bien sûr, lorsqu'on parle du langage, il faut il faut mentionner les orthophonistes, les spécialistes de l'évaluation de la prise en charge des difficultés langagères. Euh, souvent, euh, ils peuvent donc tenter de réadapter ou bien de compenser les pertes par d'autres moyens. Euh, il y a aussi l'association québécoise des personnes aphasiques et la société d'Alzheimer avec euh, des groupes de soir et, et, et des, 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 des sciences d'information et des, euh, des, des prises en charge plus 
psychosociale liée aux difficultés euh, du langage. Il y a certaines cliniques comme Lucie Bruno qui ont des cliniques spéciales pour euh, des aides technologiques euh, comme des tablettes, l'usage des tablettes, des, des, des synthétiseurs, des voix et d'autres outils technologiques pour tenter de pallier aux difficultés expressives. Vous pouvez être référé aux besoins à ces euh, centres de réadaptation. Et euh, tout récemment, on a mis en place euh, des projets de recherche des collaborations avec l'Institut euh, des cardiologies de Montréal et le Centre Épique avec le docteur Libéraire, euh, en fait, euh, des collaborations pour euh, tenter de euh, bénéficier des, des, des bienfaits de l'entraînement euh, physique à haute intensité euh, euh, pour euh, les troubles euh, du langage aussi. Euh, donc, pour voir là, s'il y a une amélioration euh, du, euh, du langage via les, les bienfaits d'exercice euh, physique. Voilà, donc euh, ça c'est. Euh, euh, J'aimerais bien vous remercier de votre attention. Si vous avez euh, toute, toute euh, question, n'hésitez pas à m'écrire ou à écrire à notre secrétariat pour. Euh, euh, ça me ferait grand plaisir de euh, répondre à vos questions et euh, vous donner plus de renseignements sur euh, ce sujet. Merci beaucoup et euh, au plaisir et bonne continuation. We've heard a lot about our from our from our clinicians, from our doctors, from our members in the community. We thank each and every one of you very much for attending and helping us spread the word and the work of the scientists and the clinicians of the McGill Research Center. And this is your support keeps us going. Many amongst you have been our regular supporters by attending the Brainy Boomer lecture series and our exercise classes to help you keep fit in both body and mind. And if you wish to help us continue with our productive work, please do consider a donation to the center for us. The link as to where and how you can donate is mentioned in the chat box. So please do not hesitate to look up in the chat box and do whatever you can. Have a great rest of the day and thank you very much for attending this wonderful session. <laughs>